This is for Keeps, a podcast about collections and connections. I'm David Peterkovsky. It's time to boogie, yogie, oogie. Back in the late 1970s, when it came to crazes, disco was king. And the most famous and infamous discotheque of them all was in the heart of New York City, a glitzy, glamorous, exclusive, and frequently wild nightclub named for the midtown Manhattan street it was on, Studio 54. The brainchild of businessmen Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager, Studio 54 was a spectacle, the place to see and be seen during the disco era. From its opening in the spring of 1977, the club attracted A-list entertainers, including Diana Ross, Elton John, Elizabeth Taylor, Michael Jackson, and Sylvester Stallone, to name just a few. Bianca Jagger, then the wife of rocker Mick Jagger, even rode a white horse through the club one night. But Studio 54 was also a high-profile haunt for people of power, from former First Lady Jackie Kennedy Onassis to the notorious Roy Cohn, the pit bull of an attorney who represented the club owners, as well as the then up-and-coming real estate developer, Donald Trump. Known for its permissive attitudes toward open drug use and sexual shenanigans of all kinds, Studio 54 also attracted a wide range of everyday revelers who hoped to get into the club. The doormen were notoriously choosy as to which regular Joes and Janes they'd let in, But judging from this 1978 TV news report on the club, it didn't stop people from lining up and vying to get past the velvet rope. Can I ask you, why why do you want to get into Studio 54? I want to dance. Dance? Have you ever gotten in before? No. Is this very important to you to get in here? You want to get in? Why? Why do you want to get into it's Studio 54? It's beautiful inside. It's, it's a fantasy out there. Have you been in there before? Yeah. Have you been in? No. I have not been. I have not been. And here's a fun fact. The song you're hearing now, the disco anthem La Freak, was written shortly after members of the band Chic were turned away at the door of Studio 54. True story. Like all fads, Disco faded, falling out of favor by the early 80s, which coincidentally is when federal agents raided Studio 54 and arrested Rubel and Schrager, who in 1980 were convicted on charges of tax evasion and sent to prison. The club closed, then reopened for a few years in the 1980s, before eventually shutting down for good in 1986. Rubel died of AIDS in 1989, while Schrager reinvented himself as a luxury hotel developer. The party may have ended, but the legacy of Studio 54 seems to be the cultural moment it captured, a moment when disco reigned, and when self-expression, and even self-indulgence, were celebrated. Still, when it comes to pop culture's love for the club and its history, the beat goes on, thanks to folks like Steve DeRoche. Steve is a journalist based in Provincetown, Massachusetts. He's also an inveterate collector having collected everything from pink elephant barware to beauty pageant trophies. And years ago, his fascination with the lore of 54 led him to amass a sizable collection of memorabilia from the fabled hotspot. Steve collected everything from guest lists that told employees who to let into the club, to -to hard-to-find pairs of Studio 54-branded jeans, to party invitations for some of the club's more outlandish, star-studded events. And... In a nice bit of symmetry, Steve's collection of Studio 54 items, like the club itself, didn't hang around very long. Several years ago, Steve donated two dozen or so items to the Museum of the City of New York, where the history he'd accumulated about the legendary night spot could be seen and enjoyed by anyone. Velvet rope be damned. Now in his late 40s, Steve was too young to visit Studio 54 in its hedonistic heyday. 
Instead, he had to settle for the home version. I was very, very young and um, was at my grandparents' house. And my mother's sister, my Aunt Gail, she had Down syndrome, so she was really more like a sibling than an aunt often, you know, and she loved to decorate her room in various themes over things she had read or saw on TV, you know, so say if the Wizard of Oz was on, she would decorate her room in that way. And she used to love to read People magazine, all the grocery store magazines. And she had read an article, I think it was the premiere party for the movie Grease, which was held at Studio 54. And she loved Olivia Newton-John, and she loved disco music. So she had decorated her room to be a disco and she called it Studio 54. And she invited my sister and I into the disco. We were able to sort of jump her imaginary velvet rope <laughs> and play with her in the room and listen to her disco albums. And she kept saying, this is Studio 54. And so I would read all her magazines and she just kept talking about it. I think she herself was fascinated by it because, you know, in her life, she lived with my grandparents, her parents. She never really was, of course, able to go out on her own. So she sort of had these imaginary worlds, which as a kid was fantastic. And um, that memory always stuck in my head. So that must have been 1978. So I was four years old. So um, that's about the first time I became aware of it. As a young adult, Steve read up on the club's brief but colorful history and he made a fateful visit to New York and to the building where Studio 54 had once been, a far cry from the make-believe version from his childhood. And at what point did you graduate from uh, the fake Studio 54 to the real one? Well, <laughs> I was uh, obviously too young to go to it at its heyday, but I was always just so interested in it, and I could I would read anything I get my hands on. And I read a book by Anthony Hayden Guest, I think it was Studio 54 and basically a history of New York City nightlife, but focusing on that. And that would have been in the late 90s. And then also at a time, right about 1998, and I discovered a book called Fabulous, a photographic diary of Studio 54 by a photographer um, named Bobby Miller. So those two books I uh, became aware of at the same time. And then I was planning to go to graduate school, and I ended up going to, to graduate school in New York City, and I had been there to visit the schools, um, New York University and Columbia. And it was the year 2000, so it was New Year's Eve 2000-2001. Somebody was throwing a New Year's Eve party in Studio 54. Um, I know the basement has become a, a really popular cabaret space, and the Roundabout Theatre Company has often used it to stage musicals. But before that New Year's Eve party, I had gone to see the revival of Cabaret starring Alan Cumming, both because I wanted to see the musical, but I just wanted to be in the building. I just wanted to look around. I just wanted to um, imagine what it was like back in its heyday. And then when New Year's Eve 2000, 2001 came, some friends and I had bought tickets to go to this party. To be honest, the party was just okay. I mean, we had fun. You're in New York, it's New Year's Eve. But again, it was just fun to walk around the building with music of the day playing and just trying to absorb and feel uh, the energy of what it must have been like back in the 70s. So you've always kind of been looking back and nostalgic for something you never really got to experience yourself. That's very much true. I've always loved history and I've loved history of all kinds. And I've, especially working as a journalist, um, I've always cautious around nostalgia because I don't know who said it, but someone once said that nostalgia is reality's drunk cousin. Um, <laughs> so, so it's not exactly as people remember it. And maybe some of the bad stuff gets less to side. And especially living where I do in Provincetown, we have such a connection to New York City. And, um, I've heard all kinds of stories about Studio 54 living here. And they've come up in my work as a journalist, in particular, because Roy Cohn, who was Studio 54's attorney, he spent about 15 summers here in Provincetown. So it's funny how often in my work, in one way or another, Studio 54 will pop up. <laughs> you're still kind of close, even though you're a few states away and a, a couple decades away. Exactly. It's just it's one of those things that just kind of keeps reemerging, which I think is sort of testament to like the cultural moment that it was in real time. Again, the good, the bad and the ugly of it all. When I was younger, I only focused on the good. It looked like so much fun and the music must have been fun and all the celebrity and the flash and the, you know, the pop and everything. As I got older and I met people who lived through that era, the burnout when the party was over wasn't so pretty, but they do attest that it was a really, really good time. 
Steve started collecting Studio 54 items in the late 90s, acquiring his first piece while in New York. And it was a doozy, a unique party invitation from a very unique singer, model, and actress. I was in New York, and I was in, uh, you know, I don't know what you would call them, not even really an antique store, but sort of like a, you know, here on the Cape, we call them a -a bric-a-brac shop. It's just sort of random stuff. And I found an old party invitation. It was to Grace Jones's, um, well, it was a New Year's Eve party, but it was, the invitation was from Grace Jones, and it was a black cylindrical tube that you would receive in the mail. And when you opened it up, you pulled out this plastic gold wine glass, and you could put it together and it said Studio 54 on it and then there was a gold leaf scroll and it was your invitation Um, and I believe that was either 77, 78 or 78, 79 uh, New Year's Eve and I thought like, what a cool party invitation and I was so excited by being able to hold an actual artifact from the day. I'm not really a magical thinker but as close as I get to it is I kind of believe that artifacts sort of emanate this energy that it, it brings you a little closer to a period in history. I mean I guess that's why we have so many museums around the world because it gives you this connection to a narrative a story of um, usually of a time you weren't around for and something about that invitation just really resonated with me and then I just kept hunting for them and it got a lot easier once I don't know if eBay I don't know when eBay came around but once I became aware of it in the early days you could find a lot of Studio 54 memorabilia and easily have it authenticated and that sort of began my collecting years with Studio 54 artifacts Uh uh-huh And were you aware of a collector's community when it came to Studio 54 stuff? Not really, because the people that I was buying from, they had either themselves bought it somewhere and they they sold all kinds of materials. I didn't become aware of it later until I moved to Provincetown. And I would meet people who, again, who had been there and they were trying to collect things that they probably one day already had, but either threw out or didn't think of them as important. You know, they treated them like the ephemera they were. You know, I guess when you're in it, you don't realize that you're being a part of history. So I did meet a lot of people here who were trying to uh, recoup what they had lost or once had. But online, I was just meeting people who were just, you know, straight up dealers, that this was just one of many things that they had in their possession that they were selling. And I think around that time, in addition to those books, there was a movie and it was about, I guess it would be the 20th anniversary of the opening of the club. So there was that renewed interest. It always seems 20 years is when things become retro, vintage, you know, people get more interested in those things. But I did for a long time feel as if I was on to something um, completely by myself. You know, I collect a variety of other things, and there was always a community I could talk to or bounce things off of. But at that time, I really didn't find anybody until I moved to Provincetown, which would have been 2002. After the Grace Jones party invitation, Steve scored some other party invitations, as well as some items that speak to the exclusivity and uniqueness of Studio 54. I found this fantastic inflatable um, invitation to a Valentine's Day party. I believe it was 1978. It was a big black heart with the inscription in red. And then lots of, uh, you know, placards, or I guess you'd say like normal card invitation. But my biggest coup that I just was so excited over was three pieces of paper that were guest lists to parties at Studio 54, and one of which was on Studio 54 letterhead, handwritten, and it had names like Liberace, uh, who else was on there? Carol Douglas was like a soap opera star who was trying to have a disco career, Uh, Ringo Starr, and it was all these lists, and it was like who had to pay, who got in for free, and then on the back of one of them was a Chinese food order. (laughs) (laughs) So it it so clearly was this, uh, you know, like, so the real deal, you know, from their office. And it's quite some time ago now that I bought it. But the woman I bought it from, you know, she gave me her name because before I bought them, I just wanted to make sure they were real. And um, they, of course, looked age appropriate, but I was checking it out. And when she gave me her name, the really cool thing is that when I moved to Provincetown, I met the photographer, Bobby Miller, who published that book, Fabulous, a photographic diary of Studio 54. Unbeknownst to me, he was living in Provincetown all these years. So when I gave him um, her name, he said, oh, yeah, she was the secretary you know, for the club. So like, I know her. So once he authenticated that she was indeed an employee of the club and that it would make all the sense in the world that she would have these in her possession, then I bought them. And to date, it's the most exciting Studio 54 uh, memorabilia I've ever seen. So you authenticated the authenticator. Indeed. (laughs) I'm a journalist. I double check. (laughs) (laughs) 
Also standing out in Steve's collection were two very hard-to-find articles of clothing that bore the Studio 54 brand. What can you tell me about the two pairs of Studio 54 jeans that were in your collection? Yeah, you know, as I was doing more and more research, and I can be a complete nerd when it comes to my collections, I was kind of fascinated by the way, you know, Studio 54 was marketed, kind of in the same way Woodstock was, that this event eventually becomes something that not only becomes the mark of a generation, but then people sort of have that nagging regret that they couldn't have been a part of it themselves. I do remember my sister wanting a pair of Studio 54 jeans when we were kids, so if she's asking for these, if I was four or five, she would have been nine or 10. And I remember my mother specifically saying that those weren't appropriate for her. <laughs> they, like, it was it was for adults, not for kids. <laughs> I mean, they're just blue jeans, but like completely unbeknownst to my sister and I, we had no idea of the very adult things that were going on at the disco. We just thought it was a fun disco. So I remember my sister being really upset she couldn't have a pair. So I had first purchased the two posters advertising the jeans. And then I kept hunting for a pair of the blue jeans and also for, I guess you'd say they're like fuchsia velour, which were even harder to find. And so um, I think both of them I landed on eBay, but it took months and months of scouring and also losing a few auctions because they went for um, quite a bit of money. But uh, I was really happy to get them. But I live in Provincetown where we have all these occasions to dress up. And every once in a while, someone throws a retro Studio 54 party. And there was one that summer when I bought these two jeans. But um, of course, when they arrived, there was no way I was going to fit into them. These were for someone much smaller. (laughs) 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 But I was super psyched I was going to wear them to the party. But yeah, that wasn't going to happen. And where did you uh, get the ads for the jeans? Was that also on eBay? Yeah, eBay was the source for most of the material. And then when I moved here, we have a couple of antique stores, and the owners would call me if anything Studio 54 related came their way. And so I did get um, a few of the invitations that way. But I think it was just the invitations. And there was also a letter. There was some letter I had that was in regards to like a beverage order and like something to do with light bulbs as well. And I found that here in Provincetown. Someone had died and it was the estate sale. And the owner of, you know, some of the antique stores we have in town, when someone passes away, they'll just call the antique store and say, can you just take care of all the stuff in the house and take what you want? And they were going to throw it out, but they gave it to me because it was so unusual and weird that they didn't think there was really a market for it, but they knew I collected those things. So um, they had just saved it and gave it to me. And it really was one of the most boring artifacts related to Studio 54. But um, nevertheless, because I had the collection, I thought if I kept it as part of it, um, the value of it, at least historically, would mean a little bit more. Well, lighting was important there. (laughs) Right, right, right. (laughs) Or maybe the lack of in certain corners, I don't know. Yeah. So when you were collecting, were there any Studio 54 items out there that you had hoped to acquire but were never able to track down? There were some. Well, you know, this was I knew immediately it was obviously way out of my price range. But the cocaine moon and the sun that hung in the club went up for auction at Sotheby's. Just just so we're all on the same page, can you describe what those items are exactly? <laughs> sure. The lesser known one, um, it, it's it's a big light up sun. Um, I don't know if you ever watch CBS Sunday Morning, but it kind of looks like their logo. Um, just sort of a big sun with a face on it smiling. But the more famous artifact, which went for much more money, was a crescent moon with a face. And at various times in the evening, um, the sp- there was a spoon that would light up and head towards the nose of the face. And then presumably a, 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 the light up line of light bulbs was supposed to be a line of cocaine that was going to the moon's nose. And then when it hit the nose of the moon, the moon would twinkle. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so you can find lots of books where they, they have that photographed in the back. And I think the starting bid for each was at least $10,000. And this has to be about 20 years ago now. I I know they, of course, sold and they sold for much more than that. But at first I had heard they had sold for the knockoff Studio 54 in Las Vegas. But that must have been a rumor because they're not there. Because on a trip to Vegas, I swung by. It's I mean, it's it's, it's like the McDonald's of Studio 54. It's just, you know, it's just the name and a few uh, artifacts and photos hanging in the club because I wanted to see if they were actually there and they weren't. But what I did add to the collection was the Sotheby's catalog that those two items were listed. But in my head, I thought if I was a 
wealthy person, um, those would be in my collection in a heartbeat. About a month ago, I'm a journalist, so I write for a Provincetown magazine and I cover all kinds of things. But I also record interviews for StoryCorps of all kinds. And I interviewed Felipe Rose, who was the Native American of the village people. And um, we talked about all kinds of things, but he talked, of course, about Studio 54. And that moon is one of the first things that people mention when I say, so you walk into the club, you get in, or in his case, he's coming in probably from the back because he's performing there. Um, but he did both perform and party there. But he mentioned that moon. Everybody I know who's been there, when if you don't leave the question, say, what do you remember when you looked around? They say, I remember the cocaine moon. <laughs> 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 it, it sticks in people's minds. And a lot of people will obviously say their memories of their time there are fuzzy. But ironically enough, that's the most clear one. Uh-huh. And a very <laughs> fitting one. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Because back then, they'll tell you that... I don't know who told them, but you'll often hear that they didn't think cocaine was addictive or that it was bad for you, which I, I kind of find hard to believe, but that's something I hear a lot of. Huh. How about that? <laughs> yeah. I think the 1920s proved cocaine was bad for you, but they must have forgotten by the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> Having worked as a journalist in Provincetown for two decades, Steve has encountered many folks who were in New York City during the heyday of Studio 54 leading him to collect anecdotes and other impressions about what the nightclub was really like. Anybody with any type of story either is referred to me, thankfully, or seeks me out. And um, I love that because I love documenting stories. I love collecting stories. And any collection I've had has always, in my mind, been an extension of storytelling. Um, the narrative that's within the collection that I create. So in this case, a narrative of this club, Studio 54. And most recently, how Studio 54 has kind of come up a lot is, like, as I mentioned with Roy Cohn, because you know, when you know who was president, everyone was sort of re-examining Roy Cohn and his life because he was the mentor for someone who would one day become president. And he was an awful human being, so people in Provincetown will often remember him being here. But then when they're looking at his life more fully, people started to have sort of a reckoning. People would be like, well, you know, I had a really good time when I was at Studio 54 and I was young and carefree. And, you know, you saw Elizabeth Taylor and Halston and all these people. But when they really now get a chance to dip behind the curtain of Studio 54 and see the mechanisms that ran the place, they realize that there was a dark side to it, too. And that's what I've been hearing about a lot um, here. People realizing, um, you know, they were completely unaware. Why would you be aware if you're just in a nightclub? You don't know any of the nefarious ongoings behind the scenes and that there's bags of cash in the, in the ceiling so they don't have to pay taxes and who are they paying off and, and who is running the place. So um, I think the dark side of Studio 54 is something I've heard about for the past five years, in particular because Roy Cohn was such a figure here in Provincetown. Mm-hmm. An, an interesting hypocritical one at that. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, the hypocrisy is uh, neck deep. <laughs> <laughs> and I also think, um, you know, living here in Provincetown, it, not just anecdotally, but I think there's actually data to support it now that the majority of residents here are LGBT. And so Studio 54 has this extension amongst the gay community as, you know, a symbol of the sexual revolution, a symbol of freedom. And, you know, it's very much in a way like the town of Provincetown is. It's a mixture. It's a real uh, stew of humanity where you can be who you, who you are and no one's really going to come down on you for it. Some of the items in Steve's collection come from what was essentially a second incarnation of Studio 54 in the 80s, in the years following the imprisonment of the club's owners. Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager went to prison for, I think it was tax evasion is eventually what they got them on. And I think the way it had to work, because uh, since they were convicted felons, when they get out of prison, you know, for instance, they couldn't have a liquor license in their name. So I think in name, there was a different owner, but it was still really Steve Rubell and Ian Schrager. But both in terms of my feeling and how history and culture was going at the time, I am much more interested in the 1977 to 1980. Thereafter, I think the culture had just changed. So disco suddenly is getting pushed to the wayside. So a disco club uh, is no longer as popular. And then you have the dawn of the Reagan era. So this sort of permissiveness, and with all its faults, is now being 
replaced with a conservatism with all its faults. So it just feels to me that I'm still interested in the history of it, but it's like a sequel. It wasn't as good as the first one. But I also was interested in it before it became a club, just because, again, as sort of hocus pocus as I get, you just look at this building and it's just the history of it, all that went on it. And, you know, it was a television studio before it was the club. It had this whole life before. And so I had tried to find artifacts related to that, but to no avail, because I just thought this building, this space has such a mystique to it. And it still does. You know, living here in Provincetown, we get a lot of Broadway stars that perform here in the summer. And they perform now at 54 Below, which is a cabaret space in the basement of what had been the club. And I interviewed Patti Lapone, And when she was in Evita, she was the toast of New York. And so she used to party at Studio 54. And she, in her nightclub act in 1979, um, she, re- she reveals this nightmare that she has, that she's at the entrance to Studio 54 and they won't let her in. <laughs> and... Um, that she has to answer these questions, these three questions to get into the club. And then she eventually does. But I remember talking to her about that because she performs occasionally at 54 Below when she's doing a cabaret show now. And um, she talks about the energy that emanates from that building and um, you know, remembering being there and uh, when she was much younger and right at the cusp of just becoming a superstar. So that's what's kind of always interested me beyond the disco is what is it about this building that keeps attracting this kind of attention and the oral history seems to be there and keeps finding its way out it really does it's it's a story that won't die and it keeps resurfacing in one way or another so i want to switch gears again and ask you about letting your studio 54 collection go what made you decide to do that Well, I think in total, with any collection I have, I always collect with the goal of donating it somewhere in in the future. I reach a point with any collection, including the Studio 54 one, where I'm just like, this deserves a life beyond just myself, and it deserves a larger life for people who are interested in the same thing, who maybe they themselves didn't have the means or the know-how or or the whatever to collect all these artifacts together, which again, piece together to tell their own narrative. And then just from a practical sense, I live by the ocean, and for a huge part of the year, it's very humid, so it's murder on things here. You really have to be a good steward of any artifacts and materials you have and know when it's time to pass it on to someone who can take proper care of it. So particularly those guest lists, I was starting to get concerned because in the brief, relatively brief time that I had them, I saw them age a bit more. So again, I always end up donating collections I have to an appropriate museum, library, or archive. So I had gone to a wedding in New York City and I popped by the Museum of the City of New York and I just loved it and I loved that it wasn't a stuffy account of New York City. It wasn't only focused on one period of time or on one class. It was like the entire history of New York. So I had written to them and started a dialogue because I think New York City nightlife is just really of global interest. And again, in its entirety, there's a fascinating history. So I mentioned all the artifacts that I had and would they be interested? And I think they wrote back within 20 minutes saying, absolutely. So I sent it all there. So now it's in a proper climate controlled environment. I, I think they've displayed a few of the artifacts over the time since I've given it to them. And I think that my donating that to the museum has generated other donations of materials that I didn't have that now sort of complement what the museum has. That's amazing. And you never succumb to the temptation to give it to the Studio 54 Light in Las Vegas? Uh, never. <laughs> <laughs> never. Because as much as I, you know, like, especially when I was young, as I had mentioned, like, oh, man, going to Woodstock would have been fun. Or, you know, oh, man, Studio 54 would have been fun. I, from a very early age, realized time only moves in one direction, or at least as humans, we experience it in one direction. And you can't go back. So... When I was in college and they're doing like Woodstock 94, or I hear that this, you know, Studio 54 is opening in Las Vegas, it's like, nope, it is over. I mean, stick a fork in it over. Like, it's time for something new. And that's, that's what you got to do. Keep an eye out for something new. This is history. And as every day goes by, it's becoming ancient history. <laughs> but I did go in, I did go out of curiosity, but I was like, this is a sanitized tourist trap. <laughs> <laughs> And along the line of regret, do you uh, regret giving up everything? I mean, do you wish you had secretly held on to something? 
<laughs> no, because I always know where it is. Like if I really, really want to see it again, I know where I can go to do that. And I, I'm a journalist, but as a, in my undergrad, I studied history and the expression lost to history sends a chill up my spine. So it always makes me feel good when something that I've assembled, a collection I've assembled, finds a good, proper home. I know that that collection is going to live on long beyond me. I clearly know that I'm not alone when these museums pounce at them. And then I, over the years, hear from people such as yourself that I know that it's kind of having the desired effect. It feels selfish to me to hang on to a collection too long. I ultimately feel the impulse to share it. I was just hoping you'd find like a disco ball stuff behind your couch or something. Oh, well, that's different. If I had found an authentic Studio 4 disco ball, it would still be in my house. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about that. Or if I had a house big enough for the cocaine moon, that's where it would be. <laughs> <laughs> and I should add, just not that anybody cares, but um, I've never tried cocaine in my life, probably because of some of the cautionary tales that I've heard from uh, Studio 54. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> So it's like a uh, an anti-drug uh, commercial or something. Uh, indeed. Yeah, a really flashy one that looks like a good time. But ultimately, you're like, you know what? Like, I think I'm going to pass. <laughs> <laughs> so one last question for you. Obviously, Studio 54 is closely associated with a certain time in the history of American pop culture and New York history. If someone wanted to revisit the Studio 54 brand and create a new nightclub in New York that paid tribute to the club's colorful past, do you think it could work at all? I don't. I really don't. I think that anything is of its time. Anytime you do a reenactment of something, it just feels that way. It's just a different time. Too much has changed. Too much has passed. People think differently. It's, I just don't think it would. I think it could work as a, a nostalgia theme night where you come dressed but, you know, this, there comes a certain time, like, again, I'm getting close to 50, so I'm experiencing it now, that when the fashion of your youth becomes a Halloween costume, it's never a good day. <laughs> and when you look at Studio 54, people dress up for Halloween like that now. So if you tried to do something that was that steeped in nostalgia, it would just come across like a Halloween party to me. That being said, I would like to see... New York and other cities sort of shake off the puritanism and the moralism that came with the Reagan era and just uh, loosen up a bit and have the era of like the big nightclub come back, but reimagined and maybe a little safer, you know, ditch the drugs and find a way just to have a good party, but of its time and just make it spectacular. There's no other way to do it except an authentic way. Well, Ian Schrager's still out there. So why don't you shoot him a business plan? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, uh, well, I think he got a pardon from President Obama. And so uh, I don't know what he's doing these days. But uh, yeah, I don't think he'd be interested in what I have to say. But <laughs> <laughs> I guess you never know. <laughs> but if I did get to talk to Ian Schrager, I have a ton of questions about Roy Cohn, <laughs> which I'm sure he doesn't want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> If I may say one more thing, with the recent passing of Olivia Newton-John, my friend Bobby Miller gave me a print of this wonderful shot of Olivia Newton-John and Andy Warhol at Studio 54 at the Grease Party. And that print I donated to my alma mater. I went to Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts, and they have an art collection, and they were looking to modernize it and uh, include photography and what have you. So I donated it to my college's art collection. But it's been really fun and funny to talk to current college students. And I get to be the person that introduces them to the lore of Studio 54 as someone who wasn't even there. But they've never heard of it. They don't know anything about it. And so once you start to tell them the whole story, they're just sort of wide eyed. And it's all through this photograph of Olivia Newton John and Andy Warhol. And it's just so of its time. But um, that's sort of the last item, I think, with any relation to Studio 54 that I've had that I've let go of recently. You really don't hold on to anything. I really don't. I, I mean, as a, a natural born collector, eventually you start to, you don't want to be weighed down by stuff. And again, I just, I want it to have a life beyond me. So uh, I've become an armchair archivist and I'll just find good homes for it so people can enjoy it and take what they want from it and learn from it. It's a good approach. Yeah. It's been fun for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, Steve, that's everything I've got for you. I want to thank you so much for speaking with me about your Studio 54 memorabilia collecting days and the unique legacy of New York's most famous nightclub of all time, I think. I would say so. I would say so. Yeah. And I'm I'm reminded, uh, what do they say at closing time at the bar? You you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Indeed. Indeed. That remains true. (laughs) (laughs) But thank you for reaching out. It's been fun talking to you. You bet. Thanks again. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, the party that was Studio 54 may be over, but the memories of the fabled club as an over-the-top, excess-friendly fantasy land aren't fading out anytime soon. And thanks to Steve's foresight in donating his pieces of Studio 54's history, at least some of the artifacts of those fun-filled nights still resonate, kind of like an infectious groove that you can't quite get out of your head. For Keeps is a production of me, David Peterkovsky. My thanks to Steve DeRoche for talking about his ongoing passion for all things Studio 54, and the collection of club memorabilia that he's passed along to the Museum of the City of New York. At ForKeepsPodcast.com, you'll see photos of Steve and some of the items that he donated to the museum. The show's theme song is by Still Flyin', and the closing theme is by Eric Frisch. Additional music for this episode was provided by Kinsis Marrera, Tope for More and Alex Elena, and Bizbaz Studio. Thanks for listening to For Keeps. Until next time, keep on keeping on. <laughs>